emergency room in Egan talking with Dr. Brian Jones about winter injuries and sports related injuries related to kids and there's some new research out that parents should be aware of. Why don't you tell us about some of this new research and what it's saying? Uh, I, I think uh, basically what they're what they were looking at is that uh, younger kids tend to have more severe head injuries uh, after injuries while skiing or snowboarding, and that has to do with kind of the way their bones are a little thinner, and also their heads are disproportionately large compared to their body, so they get a little, oh, yes. a little more acceleration when they're falling. And does it matter what type of sport that or activity that they're doing, more recreational or more of the, I don't know, the going down the slopes and stuff? Yeah, um, with the younger kids, we see more injuries with uh, uh, skiing, uh, and it tends to be more head injuries. And with the older adolescents, uh, it's often more snowboarding, and we often see uh, spleen injuries or in abdominal injuries. Um, what about like just skating injuries or sledding injuries? I mean, you think that's kind of not as it's just more you know, not as dangerous and stuff, but that sure. can also produce some injuries. Sure. Uh, anytime you're on a slippery surface, you're, you have a potential to fall, and uh, the ice is hard when you hit it with your head or your arm. You can We see a lot of fractures uh, from falls while skiing and, and sledding. Uh, and, the, and while the snow can be soft, the ice that you land on after sledding can be hard and can get scrapes and cuts. I just think that parents will be more surprised by the research saying about the skull fractures or the facial injuries and things like that. I mm -hmm. just don't think they think of those type of injuries. Yeah, it's important that the kids wear helmets because we know that that does make a huge difference on, on the serious injuries. It doesn't necessarily prevent a concussion, but can prevent the fracture or the brain, the brain injuries. What would be some other things that parents should do to help? protect their young ones from yeah. injuries like yeah. this. Um, make sure that they're doing those activities in areas that are safe for their size and ability. Uh, you don't want it, you know the untrained skier to be on a, a black diamond slope right away. Um, so make sure that they're taking lessons and know what they're doing before you turn them loose and that they understand the danger signs. And also do it in areas where they're less likely to fall off of a slope or into trees uh, for skiing or snowboarding. Mm -hmm. um, try to encourage them not to tackle things that are beyond their abilities, uh, which sometimes can be difficult uh, with kids. And they should w definitely wear a helmet, and that's not something that um, you want parents to skimp on. Uh, that's not a place to save money because those helmets really do save brains and save lives. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, I know I was thinking back to my grand. I mean, my son actually, he tore his ACL mm -hmm. snowboarding kind of thing, trying to go off some kind of jump or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we often see injuries on the terrain parks where they're going off the equipment and fall and oh, yes. hit not only their heads but the abdomen or come down funny on an arm and end up with a fracture or internal injury. Any other type of um, winter sports injuries that parents should be aware of to protect their kids? Um, uh, sprains and strains often happen with skating and skiing and snowboarding, but also can happen with sledding if they fall funny or come off the uh, sled funny. And try and, not to go head first on the sled. <laughs> try not to go head first on the sled. And we also see head injuries there as well when, when kids, sometimes it, if there's a mismatch in sizes in kids that are on uh, uh, sleds, um, that can cause some problems too. But if they have one of these injuries, the urgency room is one of those places Absolutely. that they can come to yeah, if you're, emergency physicians. Yep, we, we have uh, trained physicians. We can tell you whether you need a CAT scan to look for more serious injuries. Uh, we have that equipment here uh, for fractures. We can certainly do x-rays and set those if they, they need to be taken care of. Other advice to make this a safe winter sports for all, all the kids? Um, make sure you're wearing the right equipment, especially helmets. Um, uh, be in places where you feel comfortable uh, and make sure you have some training. And again, you talked briefly about the urgency room, but for those not familiar with the urgency room, what's it all about? Yeah, uh, we're an acute care destination where we can handle everything from a sore throat to a broken arm or a head injury. Um, we're located in Egan, Vadness Heights, and Woodbury, and we're open seven days a week. All right, great advice, Dr. Brian Jones. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this. Son, love is like the ocean. You have to tread the oh, waters. Oh, Dad, that's not the kind of help I needed. Jessica, will you go to prom with me? Yes. Thousands of teens in foster care can't wait to share their first with you. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. February is known as American Heart Month, and it brings awareness to heart disease and how to prevent this number one killer of both men and women. And we're very pleased to have back with us Dr. Les Forgosh with Health East Heart Care. So thank you for being with us. It's been a few years, so thank you. And I know you're very busy, so we really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and it's always a pleasure to come back and talk with you and be interviewed. So how do you know if you have heart disease? 
That's actually a good question. A lot of people who are out there may have heart disease and are not aware of it, but usually if you have heart disease, you'll have the symptoms of chest discomfort, you may have some shortness of breath, you might have some generalized fatigue. I have this little saying that I like to say to people, for particularly women, because women don't have the classic chest discomfort, anything between lips and hips, anything lips between and hips. lips and hips that bothers you, if there may be a discomfort in there, a stabbing sensation, a muscle pull, there's a shortness of breath, abdominal discomfort, indigestion, could be a sign of heart disease. But like I said, a lot of people, maybe not a lot, less than half would be what we call asymptomatic, where they don't have the classic shortness of breath, the chest discomfort, they might be slowing down, they might not be as able to shovel the driveway as quickly as they did last year. They too could have heart disease and would need us to go ahead and look into that. You know, and during this flu season too, I mean, chest discomfort it could be a very common thing if you've got congestion and things like that. So it's hard to tell the difference, I would think, between what is abnormal or what is just, you know, symptoms of the, the flu or something like that. Very accurate observation that sometimes people, they go to a doctor, they say, I'm short of breath, they get a chest x-ray. Well, maybe you have a pneumonia, maybe you have the flu, whatnot doesn't clear up after antibiotics, after weeks, after maybe some Tamiflu, they end up coming back to an urgent care, somebody checks a blood test and says, oh goodness gracious, your lungs are full of fluid, or oh goodness gracious, you're in heart failure. Uh -huh. Then they get sent to the hospital, we do an ultrasound of their heart muscle, find out their heart muscle is functioning maybe at 10, 20 percent. This has not been the flu, this has not been pneumonia, but this has actually been heart failure or systolic dysfunction we call when the heart doesn't squeeze well. Are there other symptoms that people should be looking for that might say, you know, I should go in or, and when should they go seek emergency care, I guess would be another good okay. question. Well, the first part, anything for the most part out of the norm, like we mentioned, fatigue, considering chest discomfort, shortness of breath would be great. And I use the word discomfort. It's not the classic pain. If you remember, I think it was the Jeffersons. Oh, uh, yes, yes. You know, I'm coming, I'm coming. Uh, so chest discomfort, but no, it could be any sort of thing inside. Um, I look for uh, swelling of the legs, sometimes um, some fluid in the legs, uh, lower ankles, maybe some abdominal bloating. These can all be clues. Now, when to get urgent care, certainly if somebody all of a sudden is feeling great and then they have a blackout spell or shortness of breath comes up out of the blue or they all of a sudden get that discomfort in the chest, that would be concerning that probably want to seek urgent care right away. Other symptoms that might have been percolating for a few weeks or a month or so, those would be reasonable. See a primary care provider, discuss them, maybe then further testing, heart tracing, EKG, ultrasound of the heart, maybe some blood work, stress testing that could possibly help us look for underlying heart disease. Are there certain individuals that are more at risk for heart disease? Risk factors for heart disease. Uh, some of the risk factors would be, uh, number one, family history. Mm -hmm. Mother, father dying or having a heart attack or open heart surgery at a relatively young age, 60, 65, 70 would make one think. Typical risk factor panel, diabetics, especially diabetics taking insulin, those with high blood pressure for years, cigarette smokers, and once again implore, please, if smoking is in there, kind of stop smoking if possible, mm. although it's difficult to do. Um, uh, high cholesterol, certainly if somebody has relatively high cholesterol, that would be concerning for the development of heart disease. Um, those are some of the big ones, I would think so, that so they're at risk. Important to know those numbers, like your cholesterol, your blood pressure, Correct. things like that. Correct. What should, and I know that there was just a, a change in the standard for high blood pressure. <laughs> And what is it? And, and what does that mean? And we're making it difficult for people. It used to be 140 over 90 was yes. good. And even before that, I want to say it was FDR, whose blood pressure was 200 over 100. Oh it, was, yeah, it was known to be relatively high, of course, strokes involved there. But now we've lowered it to 130 over 80. So 130 over 80 is called prehypertension. So really, a pressure of 120 over 70, 110 over 60, those are numbers we want to see. 120s, 130s, but certainly you start getting up to 140s, 150s, top number, 90s, 100s, bottom number, 
those are numbers we don't want to see and we definitely will want to start medication and get those pressures down. I was going to say med medication is probably the best way. Is there other ways that you can reduce that high blood pressure? I always start with lifestyle modification. If you're drinking two drinks a day, cut it down to one. If you're not exercising, try to walk a little bit more. So alcohol can elevate? Alcohol can raise blood pressure. Okay. Um, uh, salt, salt restriction. Rather than having the salted fries from the fast food, try the unsalted fries. Anything we do, lifestyle modification, stress reduction, easier said than done. If I had a solution to uh, reducing stress, I'd be a rich man, but, but trying to reduce one's stress would be helpful, maybe even some meditation. Those kind of stop smoking, those kind of lifestyle modifications, if those don't work, then we need to start looking at blood pressure medications, of which is over 80, 90 on the U.S. market right now. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs, but only gets paid for one. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Joining us now, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Paul Shanfield. He's a Minnesota neurologist, and you um, retired in 2015 after 40 years of practice, and you're as a University of Minnesota clinical professor of neurology. You continue to teach medical students and residents in family practice and neurology. That's fantastic. So it's a pleasure to have you with us. And you've written a book that we're here to talk all about. It's called A Room, a, a Migraine in Room 3 and a Stroke in Room 4, which to you says everything that's wrong with healthcare because it's a patient with a migraine and it's a with a stroke, not the disease that you're here to treat and care for. So tell us about this book and why you wrote it. Well, thank you, Jody, and I'm really happy to be here again. Um, as you said, at the end of 2015, I retired. And after thinking about this, I decided what I was going to do next, and that was teaching. I really wanted to continue to teach. So I teach at the University of Minnesota. I teach weekly, actually, at the United uh, Family Medicine Clinic, Good last for you. 7th and decided to try and write a textbook about how I think clinical medicine should be taught. Although initially, it was just going to be a cute little coffee table book. Oh, um, well, it's, it fits very nicely on this little coffee table. <laughs> <There you laughs> <are. laughs> uh, for 40 years, I, I scribbled down little, uh, on sh little sheets of paper things that patients told me about life, about family, about approaching uh, death, about aging, yeah. and humorous things that they said, which always struck my fancy. So here's somebody seriously conveying a conversation and a problem uh, neurologically, and they're able to have uh, humor and convey wisdom to me and teach me about life. So I wrote these things down and when After I retired, I years, I, just, I bet you had boxes of <laughs> yes. little notes. <laughs> <laughs> Scraps of paper yeah. all over the place. They weren't well organized, so it took me a while to organize them. So I decided to spend the time uh, that I had and then try to put them together. So I was just going to put you know, a bunch of cute little comments about Parkinson's disease, about aging, about memory loss, and what in a book. I sat down with a... Um, writing coach. Uh, Paul Burnaby is a wonderful uh, educator um, in St. Paul. He's written multiple books. He's given hundreds and thousands of lectures and my daughter hooked me up with him. So he came uh, every other week for a couple of years and helped me organize the quotes and so wow. forth and decided to put them actually in context of our health system. And talking about your daughter, she's in the forward who very well written and it was really kind of insightful from her perspective of being a daughter of a physician growing up with that and then her thoughts about you as well. I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> yes, I didn't, I wasn't convinced that having my daughter write the forward uh, would work, but after she wrote it, it was like, wow, you just. It, hit it, it out of the park. It's great. Yeah. Um, it took a lot of work for a physician to write a book because 
it turns out I don't know English, I don't know grammar, <laughs> I don't know how to spell. Matter of fact, for, for the forward, uh, I initially spelled it F-O-R-W-A-R-D, forward. <laughs> and a forward of a book, for those of you who are as poor at spelling as I am, is before, so it's F-O-R-E, words, W-O-R-D. So it's the word of a book is spelled differently, yeah. to go forward. Yes. <laughs> The English language is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this book crystallized um, to me in words of uh, William Osler, who was a famous physician who essentially established medicine in, in North America. And he said, a good physician treats the disease. A great physician treats the patient with the disease. What a and Therefore, that's what the title of the book is. So the title of the book is A Migraine in Room 3, A Stroke in Room 4, A Physician Examines His Profession. So indeed, there is not a migraine in Room 3. There is not a stroke, as you mentioned at the beginning, in Room 4. It's a patient who has headaches in Room 3 and somebody who has suffered a stroke in Room 4. And unfortunately, I have to tell you that if you are the, on the inside of doctor's offices, it's not uncommon to hear somebody say, there's a knee in room three, doc. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of where that came from. Um, but the whole book then got postulated on the th concept that healthcare is in crisis today. It really is in crisis. And Maybe you don't understand that the way I uh, view it. The costs are excessive and are going up, yet the variable outcomes are ridiculous. There's some people do well, some people do poorly, some people get good care, some people get poor care, even though it's expensive. Uh, significant reliance on a corporate business model now, which is stifling the patient-physician interaction. And finally, there's widespread dissatisfaction amongst the patient and the physician. If you've been to the doctor recently, you were probably not all that satisfied. Um, in 2019, the Massachusetts Hospital Association, the Massachusetts Physician Association, and the Harvard School of Public Health announced that physician burnout, so that's physician, dissatisfied physicians that are having significant symptoms is an, an official crisis. Wow. So think about that. The next time you go to the doctor, Jody, there's probably a good 40% chance that that physician in front of you is suffering from one major symptom, at least of professional burnout. That and those affect, symptoms would be a variety um, of mood things. Mood disturbance, dissatisfaction, anger, wow. uh, inability to focus. Um, it's really a major issue. Um, so you outline the myths and the, you try to dispel the myths of health care. What are some of those things besides what you were just telling us? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the book actually is organized in three sections. Um, the first section is the analysis, my analysis of health care with uh, the failures of current health care, the myths of health care. The second is what my view is of how to be a successful clinician and how to teach it then. Um, in large part, this book is an, is an educational tool for physicians and medical students and medical residents. And then finally, the life lessons patients have taught me um, as they have come to me for help, but they have taught me about life, uh, family, work, approaching old age and really facing death. Your um, philosophy of health care is really patient-centered care? Yes, and that's a term that's everywhere now, of course, patient-centered care. Yes. But I really mean it. A lot of people talk about it, they don't really mean it. So the, the, as a matter of fact, you ma mentioned the myths. So one of the myths is that any, any quote, medical provider that's not a physician, that's a provider, is as good as any other one. They're interchangeable. Another myth is that um, you can take care of a patient 
just as well as if you've never seen them before and never have a history, although it may be somewhere in electronic medical record. Um, there is, it's unnecessary to see a physician. You can see a physician extender. And of course, physician extenders are important. You need um, to provide that service, to, but you have to understand the limitations and um, value of a physician extender. I know of no physician that is using a physician extender. That's a nurse practitioner or a, or a physician assistant, uh, assistant yeah. that has actually had training in how to oversee a mm -hmm. physician extender. Imagine that. Nobody has had any training in how to have somebody help them with care. <laughs> it's just by the seat of your pants, if you will. Well, it's great that you're continuing to teach these young physicians you know, this philosophy and why it's important for patient care and for the wellness of their patients as well. Uh, thank you. It it's really is very important for physicians to um, understand that it, the key is the interaction with a patient. One of my patients said to me, you don't have to apologize, Dr. Shanfield. All of us are getting used to seeing our physicians in profile. By that, they mean the physicians typing over here while oh, they're talking. Interesting. <laughs> and so is that an interaction, I tell you? Matter of fact, I told you at the beginning that I have hundreds and hundreds of scraps of paper with little cute little notes written, um, like one of my patients was admitted to the hospital uh, in St. Paul, and they ask you out of you know, necessity, who should we call in an emergency if something happens? And he said, well, anyone within hearing distance would be good for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I would scribble those things down. Um, as we turned into the electronic medical record age about six, eight years ago now, I realized that for six months, I had many of those little scraps of paper with cute little notes like that in my pocket. And I went, what, what, what? Why is that? And then I realized that I hadn't been focusing any longer on the person mm. as an individual in need. I was filling in these, you know, blanks and protocols and charts and everything on the computer to make sure it was done. So I had, I had to stop that and then be at the office two hours later at the end of the day to finish that work. So um, the readers can read about some of your patients interesting, sometimes humorous, which you would think wouldn't be humorous when they're talking about illness, aging, and dying. But uh, I thought that I found it very interesting. Also in your book, and, and you do also talk about the importance of healthy lifestyle and changing to a healthy lifestyle in, in staying well. I live by that myself personally, you know, not getting the, nearly the exercise I would love to be still getting, but I always try to eat healthy, to reduce stress and things. Why don't you tell us about those are some of your findings too as practice and, and how you can actually prevent strokes and other um, neurological diseases and stuff. Yes, it's been said in research that the way you live will determine how you get to about 80. After 80, it's genetics to, to a large extent. But to get to 80 is a big deal. And <clears throat> of course, there are many issues that everyone knows about, like smoking. A patient came back to me and said, all right, Dr. Shanfield, I read about the smoking. I understand what you're saying. It takes, on the average, about 10 years off your life. But you know. 10 years, wow. But he said, but you know, those are always the last 10. They ain't so good, usually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear me. <laughs> um, so obviously, smoking, drinking, driving safely are a big deal. But activity was the key to almost every one of these people. Social interaction and activity. An 82-year-old lady said, you are active, you move, you're dead. <laughs> and she was serious, you know. Good advice. One man lived in this small little house, but he had five acres of yard, and he said, 
the key to living a long life is cutting the grass without an electric mower yourself and having a vodka when you're done. <laughs> Um, yes, it's really important. The patients were just delightful. If you, if you listen to them as people, um, another man said that he always did his bills sitting down. I said, what? Well, he said, well, I'm worth a million bucks sitting down and stand up, standing up, I'm not worth a darn. <laughs> I've got too much arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> Another patient I had sent to physical therapy said, oh my, uh, that was not easy. I understand now why therapy and torture both have seven letters and start with the letter T. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I guess that's how you look at therapy. I think it can help you. Oh, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, was, he, he had a very difficult... Another lovely... Uh, Alzheimer patient. I was asking how she was doing. She said, well, I don't remember anything I forgot recently. <laughs> 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 and uh, a final uh, favorite comment is, I don't ever had an EMG, Jody. Uh, that's an electrical test with needles and shocks um, that is to check your nerves and muscles. Mm -hmm. So it's not pleasant. And well, after having an Is that an different EMG, than the, when they hit with the little... Hammer, tool, hammer. Yeah, this is <laughs> actually okay. poking oh, the okay. muscles with needles and shocking the nerves to see how they're functioning. So it's it's a half hour, forty five minute test. You know, uncomfortable. And one of the patients said to me, "I know why you had that sign out front now after they had the MG." I said, "What what sign? You know the sign that says no concealed guns in this clinic." <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. Uh oh. My. I'm afraid we're running out of time here, but if people are interested in finding your book, or how they go about doing that. Um, it's on Amazon, of course, um, and it's also, the website is a migraine in room three, a little, the number three, dot com, and you can email me if you want to docpaul at a migraine in room three, dot com. Final words of wisdom for our viewers about well, health care. At the end of the book, I talk about aging because we see a lot of elderly people. And the two most beautiful quotes, if I have time, um, it, the chapter begins with W.H. Auden um, that says, Death is the sound of distant thunder at a picnic, which was very meaningful to me and all of my patients. And at the end of the chapter, it's Satchel Page that said, you know, Age is a question of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. <laughs> good, good, good advice. Really good advice. It's been a pleasure to have you with us and to come back and be a guest on our show. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me, Joy. And awesome book. Yes, thank you. Thank you for writing it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our program for you. And we hope you can join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.